So, hello everybody listening. I am glad that you are back again to our series of half-hour webinars about how to use the new release 4.0 of the EMVA 1288 standard. In the last two webinars, I explained already to you basically the basics of the standards. And today, we come to something really important, namely your application. And we will ask basically the question uh, today, what should you know, or I could also say what must you know, what is really required to know about your application so that you are really capable to select the best camera for it. So that's a topic of a two days um, a webinar. Okay, so the question is, what should you know about your application to select the best camera for it. Well, I explained already to you, there is no best camera per se, except of course, if you really would have an ideal camera with, uh, with, with no deficits at all, as we discussed uh, during the, uh, the last two sessions. It really depends on your application, which camera to select. And what I would like to tell you today is what you need to know about your application to be able to do this selection process. And I have listed here the most important selection criteria, which you should really know about your application. Let me just briefly go through that list. The first question is not surprising and might be quite clear to everybody of you. If you have no light, you have uh, no image. And so the first important question is how much light do you have av available? Is there really plenty of it? Or are you really uh, in a situation where really you have to capture each photo? That makes a big difference for the camera to be selected. Equally important is it, what is the dynamic range in your scene? So the question is, what is the brightest part of your image? What is the darkest part of your image? And the, if this is a significantly large um, a range, you have, of course, much more demands for the quality of a camera signal because you would like to get a good image both in the bright part and also in the very dark part. But if you have a quite a low a dynamic range, uh, you actually do not care about much what's going on in the dark part of the image because you never capture it. I think these two selection criteria are probably what you might have also guessed or known already uh, uh, from your experience. The third question is a little bit more tricky in the sense that you may ask yourself, what, why do I need to know the spatial resolution of my uh, application? Well, of course, you need to select it to, to select uh, for the uh, uh, certain number of pixels. But what has this to do with the quality of my uh, camera? Well, the relation goes actually basically via an optical feature, which is called depth of field, which means what distance range do you really get sharp images? And we will learn uh, today, the higher the resolution, the more narrow the depth of field will be. So this has really something to do. And anyway, it's always wise to think about, do you use only as much as a resolution as you really need for your application? Because if you have just too high resolution, you have just two processes too, too much data. So it's always wise to think about what is the minimum resolution which does the job. Uh, you will save a lot of money and a lot of effort. Another important question is, which exposure times are actually required for your application or are tolerable for your, uh, your application? If you have a static scene, you don't care at all about it. But the real problem comes if you have objects which are moving, uh, then you don't want to have any motion blur 
And especially if you go to high-speed imaging, so capturing high-speed scenes, you need quite low exposure times. And everybody who has already worked in high-speed imaging, the first thing you realize, oh my dear, if I have such a short exposure time, I do not get enough light. Uh, and so I have to play either uh, to, have, to a very powerful uh, illumination or uh, you need really a very sensitive camera or both. So that is another uh, issue with the exposure time. Finally, what seems to be even more remote uh, from just looking at cameras is the very simple question, what do you want to do with your images later on? You, the simple thing is just to look at it, but often you, of course, most often you apply any kind of uh, processing. And then the interesting question is, what quality of signal, and we have learned that this is the signal to noise ratio is really a quite required by your algorithms. So then the pro type of processing you are doing determines actually which quality of camera is sufficient. And that is a very good uh, opportunity to save a lot of money. If your algorithm works with quite a low signal to noise ratio, why take a lot of effort to get a very good and expensive camera if a, if a simple and less uh, camera with less quality does the job as well? So this is as a kind of questions you should really know about your application before you start uh, selecting uh, a camera. We have seen one of the first issues is how much light is available. And then immediately we get, of course, the question, how can we determine how much light re is received by our image sensor and what parameters control how much light we receive? So that is certainly a very important question to be answered. And uh, so this will be, if I give you a brief outline of the following, we will first discuss what determines the irradiance at the image plane. Then we will think about what controls the depth of field, because uh, as I said, for many applications, it's important that you can capture a certain range of depths with sharp images. Uh, relates the whole thing to the signal to noise ratio, and then we come as usual to a question answering section at the end. So let me first, before I answer the question, what determines the irradiance at the image plane, make again the connection between the signal to noise ratio and the illumination. Why is this relation of importance? I have shown you here again the most important graph from the 1288 standard, the double logarithmic SNR plot, where you draw the signal to noise ratio in a logarithmic scale uh, as a relation of the irradiation, how much photons per pixel are received. And there you can see first the solid line here, which is the best possible sensor, the ideal sensor. And then you see these crosses um, here, which um, gives the measuring points and all of the theoretical linear curve. And the dashed curve here is if you not only uh, consider temple noise, that is the thing we discussed in the last webinar, but also non-uniformity problems. That means that each pixel is a little bit different, sensi sensi uh, has a little bit different sensitivity, and that causes of all, also a, a, de uh, a decrease of the signal to noise ratio if the non-uniformity is, is applied. What you can see again at this graph is Obviously, you get the best image quality, SNR, close to saturation, because in for at least for linear camera, it's, it, this is the case for nonlinear camera, it's a little bit more complicated, may be different, but still you can use, of course, the SNR graph to look up how much SNR do I get at different saturation ranges. So the lowest, of course, SNR is very much in the dark. And here it's really important once the curve goes down, not only here with a slope of one half parallel to the ideal curve, but it goes down steeper. That is the influence of the constant uh, dark noise. Um, so in the dark you have much. And so an uh, important question is, you see, if you have now a scene with low contrast, 
so that you can have everything close to saturation here. You get a, a, good, a good SNR everywhere. If your scene has a large dynamic range, the dark part have a much worse SNR. And so you can nicely see with this curve how important it is to, 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 to look at these questions. How much light do I have? And what is the dynamic range? If you have not enough light, you might never reach the saturation here. And then, of course, the SNR is much worse. This is why both dynamic range and also the degree of saturation you can reach, how bright your scene is or how much light is received by the image sensor is really uh, of importance. That is a relation to the 1288 standard. So now, let's look a little bit how bright an object is. That means simply the question how much light receives my camera through the lens uh, by an object. And then we can clearly see that not the whole radiation, an object typically radiates light or reflects lights in all directions. But what is only of importance to us is that small cone, which is shown here on the left, which basically enters the lens. Only this light can be used, of course, to see the object. And so the question is not how much light is radiated in total by an object, but how much light is radiated into a cone. And this function is called the radiance. That is the energy flux per area and per, it's all, per angle, but not per linear angle, but per solid angle, as it's called. That means per area, because our opening of the lens is an area. So that is basically uh, the radiance of the object. The image sensor works different. The image sensor receives basically light from all directions or from the range of directions where it is sensitive to. And uh, we can normally, with a normal image sensor, not distinguish from which direction it is coming. And so here is, it is really the question how much radiation in total is received, and that is what's called the irradiance or illuminance, uh, if you're in, in, in photometric terms. That is what the image sensor is, uh, receives. And then so the simple question is, how does the irradiance at the image plane depend on the radiance of an object? That is the question we have to answer. Well, uh, you can draw such a figure as it is here. You see here a small object area on the left side. You see the cone which is received by the lens. So the lens is actually uh, just uh, in a schematic way um, uh, shown here as two so-called principal planes. Uh, the light is received through this opening, the aperture, and then it goes to an image area um, at, the, um, at, at the image sensor. And so the question is, well, what, from what does it depend? Of course, it will certainly be proportional, so that the irradiance is proportional to the radiance here of the object. And we can immediately see if we make the aperture wider, so that more light enters, then we will have, of course, more light. And to put that into an equation, I show you this equation here, which at the first view looks a little bit difficult, uh, but actually it's not too difficult. We have here the irradiance at the image plane as a function of the radiance of the object. And it first depends on the transmissivity, transmissivity of the lens, because not all light which enters the lens uh, leaves it, some is reflected, some is absorbed. And then it depends, interestingly, not on the opening of the lens, but on the aperture number. That is this number which is always written on the lenses. It's a focal length divided by the aperture diameter. Um, and this is a so-called F number. And it goes with the F number squared, because if you uh, if, if you make, and it goes inversely because the F number, the larger the aperture diameter is, uh, the smaller is the aperture and the larger the aperture diameter is, of course, the more light we receive and it goes with the square. Um, as a small side note, it depends also, of course, of the angle, but I don't want to go into details of that. The light is entering the lens 
and it depends also on the so-called magnification because if you want to have let's say a one-to-one -one image you have to shift the image plane far away and then less light is received and that goes in as well but for normal imaging where the magnification is typically much smaller than one because the image size is much smaller than the object size only the aperture number is of importance so and this is a, a, a good uh, a figure in that sense because you know that from the lens you are using, what aperture number is uh, is on your lens. Uh, if you want to calculate now in detail how many photons are hitting a pixel, all what you have to do is take the radiation energy and divide it by the, the energy of a single photon. And the total radiation energy which is received by a pixel is the irradiance, that is watts per square meter. You have to multiply with the area of the pixel and you have to multiply about the integration time which is the so-called exposure time. That gives you the whole radiation energy a pixel is pixel of an area A and uh, integrated over an, expo uh, over an um, exposure time T exp is receiving. And the photon energy that's a little bit the changed uh, uh, Einstein equation and typically you use uh, the, the Planck constant times the frequency of light but uh, frequency of light is uh, not what we know. We learn light in uh, typically in wavelengths and then you have to take a, a, the Planck constant times the speed of light uh, divided by the wavelength of the light. And with that, uh, I've written the equation down there in some useful units uh, which make it very handy to calculate how many photons you receive for a pixel where you measure the area in micrometer square the exposure time in milliseconds, the wavelengths in micrometer, and you assume a typical irradiation which is necessary, or irradiance which is necessary at the image plane, which is typically microwatts per square centimeter. So that is just uh, for a uh, relation how you can really get how many photons you are, because the photons are then in the image sensor converted into charge units. Okay, now let's try to sum up. Can we now say how many photons per pixel we receive and relate also less to the signal to noise ratio. Well, we have learned the number of photons we receive is first proportional to the radiance of our object. So the brighter my scene is, the more photons I receive. Then it depends also on the lens, namely by 1 over nf squared, and that is might be a quite a significant factor. So if you have to close the aperture, uh, you might receive much, much less light because it goes with a square here. Then you can also see if you take an expensive image sensor with high pixel area, you receive much more photons because the object radiance is converted at the image plane into an irradiance, which is energy per area and so the pixel area with a larger pixel you can simply collect more photons and then finally of course there is a uh, the exposure time so these are the four quantities scene radiance the properties of the lens properties of our my pixel and the exposure time i can use and you can easily see you get into trouble if you have to close the, the aperture if you have short exposure times if you are working with uh, dark objects, and if you have small pixels, then the number of photons, the outcome is very bad. Why is this significant? Well, the number of photons controls basically the signal-to-noise ratio, and I have written down here the equation uh, for a linear uh, camera. In any case, if you want to forget about these details, and if we say, well, we have a good camera where the dark noise is low, you can approximately say that the signal to noise ratio is the number of the photons divided by the, uh, sorry, multiplied with the quantum efficiency, and then we take the square root out of it. So if we collect 10,000 of photons, would have a quantum efficiency of one, we would have a signal to noise ratio of 100. If we have only 100 photons collected, and also a quantum efficiency of one ideal sensor, square root out of 100 is only 10. 
So in that sense, you can immediately see how these things are related to each other and how important it is uh, what the SNR curves show you also. That is, of course, what you can directly look up in the, uh, in the, uh, in the SNR curves. Uh, I have only shown you here the relations to give you a better idea how these things are related to each other. Okay, depth of field is the next thing. Uh, a lens typically basically only at a certain object plane, with this, which is, is denoted here by this black dot, gives a sharp image at the image plane here. If the object is a little bit far away or a little bit closer, that is the open circle here, then we end up with a blur disk. And I have put here an, uh, the object as far away and uh, closer so that they have the same blur disk. And so we uh, see that in principle we can only get exactly one image plane sharp. But of course we can afford a certain blur disk and it's logical to assume that this blur disk, disk as if it's about the size of an image pixel, then we won't see that blurring and still get a sharp image. And if you look now for the equations, uh, what comes out, what is the result of that, then you can see that the depth of field that goes in the positive and in the negative direction, so it's plus minus. Hey, interestingly, it depends again on the F number. That means if we close our aperture, the depth of field gets larger. And what is also of importance is that it's inversely proportional to the magnification. So if you have a very small image compared to the object, that goes even with the square. So if the magnification gets smaller. And it's proportional, of course, to U prime, which is the, the, di the, the diameter here of our blur disk. That is how you can roughly calculate the depth of field. So that means if you, are for, if you have not much light, you have to open your aperture, which gives a small aperture number. You have only a shallow depth of field. And so you are in trouble if your application requires a large depth of field. The only way to get that is uh, basically close down the aperture, but then you need much more light uh, or have only a, a very bad image quality. So the question is, what can we do about that? That has to again to do with the relation of sensors to, um, uh, to, the, to the imaging. I have said the, in, the important issue is how large the blur disk is. And so let's assume basically that the blur disk uh, is equal to the uh, size of a pixel, pixel delta x prime. And then what is the only thing what we can do is then we can only the magnification can be varied by changing basically delta x. Because typically you have a typical object size you want to measure. And if you would have the same pixel size, the magnification is immediately uh, given. Um, and we set now the um, uh, circle of confusion equal to the pixel size and our sensor size. We have n pixels of delta x prime. And then the magnification, of course, is nothing else than n times the delta x prime divided by x, and this is typically a very small figure because our object size is much larger normally as the, uh, uh, as the se uh, uh, sensor size. And if you compute now the depth of field, we find an interesting equation that is here on the last size that the, if we have the same, keep the object size, if we keep the aperture number, and if we keep the resolution n, then if the pixel gets smaller, we get a larger depth of field. That might be an observation anybody, um, everybody might have already seen. At least those who do take pictures with their mobile phone, which has very small uh, uh, image sensors, typically in the order of a micrometer only. Or if you have taken, let's say, a high-end uh, SLR camera with much larger pixels, then you see a lot of depth of field. Uh, the depth of field with these large pixels is much smaller. And the reason is simply we capture the same object, but once with very small pixels, we get then a very large depth of field and vice versa. Uh, 
So we have really a serious trade-off. We can get a high depth of field, but with the small pixels, as you have seen, we receive not uh, uh, we do not receive enough photons and have then a very noisy signal caused by the small pixels. So that is the thing you always have to think about. Um, if you now uh, play around with another thing which uh, many have not considered, let's assume we want to have the same scene, the same object uh, taken, but now with a higher resolution. That means we could now do the following. Uh, we do not change the, the sensor size, n times delta x, but basically uh, we take just smaller, uh, smaller pixels. And then we find that if we take more pixels for the same sensor size, the depth of uh, field is inversely proportional to that. If we say we don't, do not want to change the pixel size because we do not want to spoil the quality of our uh, image, then it gets even worse. If we double the resolution, then basically the depth of field is only a quarter. So we have a narrow depth of field is a very serious issue in high resolution imaging. Of course, if you have flat objects, you don't care. If you have a satellite uh, or airplane which is far away, you don't care. But for all those things where you have typically factory automation or whatsoever, where you are several meters away, you might have a serious problem with high resolution image and narrow depth of field. I explain all these things to you because they are all interconnections. You have to consider that from your application. So the final thing I want to say, and this is actually quite easy to do, what is actually the signal to noise ratio required by your application? And I give you here three different use cases. Actually, what you really need to know is you need to do a detailed analysis what you want to do with your acquired images. If you only do visual observation, obser observation so that, let's say, a human looks at the image, then you want, of course, that you don't see any noise in the images. And there is a very simple criterion out of that. The signal to noise ratio should be larger than 50. If it's 100, uh, you that means two times better. The human observer does not see anything better because he can already not see the noise at a signal to noise ratio of 50. If the signal to noise ratio is 10, of course, we would see it. So the this is actually the simplest case where we exactly know the boundaries. Assume you have a typical segmentation task. That means you want to separate objects from the background. And uh, if you have done a good job with illumination so that you have uh, a good contrast between the object and the background, then actually a very low SNR might be sufficient. So I have as typical example, I have given you an SNR of 10. Just depends on the threshold and the, and the contrast ratio and all these kind of things. But this might be a typical case where you simply have a threshold. Where you can say a threshold is sufficient if the sensor has an SNR of 10 or 20 or 100. You don't care, 10 is enough. That is another easy situation. Well, and finally, then you have the more high, uh, higher demanding kind of, uh, of applications. For instance, if you do color measurements, if you do radiometric measurements, if you do any kind of hyperspectral imaging for chemical analysis, then you typically want to distinguish as small intensity differences as ever possible. And this is, of course, only possible with a high SNR. And here, the typical thing is the higher the SNR is, the better, of course, the quality is. So there are basically two, three types of applications. Visual observation with the clear threshold given by the, the properties of uh, the human eye. Then we have a kind of threshold uh, a kind of applications like segmentation, where the an SNR you have a typical threshold given by the quality of your algorithms. And there you can play, of course, if you have a 
more robust algorithm. You can use a reverse camera and vice versa. And then you have this typical more measuring type of things where you really uh, can be better than your competition if your the SNR is better. That is all uh, 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 another class. And I hope that with this you learned how important it is to know as much as possible about your application, also what you want to do with your images, because all these things are related. So it depends on the kind of how you illuminate, what depth of field is required, what kind of processing you do. Once you know that, then you can exactly say then what kind of properties a camera uh, should have. Well, let me just sum again what we have learned today. You need to know uh, what do you need to know about the application? Which signal to noise ratio requires the application? How much light is available? Uh, that means which irradiation can be obtained? And also, uh, what is the resolution and the depth of field uh, of your application? Because this determines the sensor resolution, pixel size, maximum exposure time, minimum aperture number, and all these kinds, all these parameters depend on each other. Well, what is next? Uh, tomorrow we will close uh, this webinar series and in this last uh, webinar I will now take the 1288 data sheet and explain to you what the different figures and graphs you find on this one page summary, summary sheet means and how you can use this data sheet in practice for camera comparison. So that closes basically the session based on what we have learned about the, the basics of the standard, what we have learned today about the application you need to know. We can put this knowledge now together for, uh, to perform camera comparisons and also to look how do we ha basically have to interpret the figures which are in the data sheets. And I will show you both the old 3.1 data sheet with uh, the new 4.0, which is not much different. So uh, it's an easy and, and smooth transition. We have just added some features and also left away uh, some features. Um, and I will also show you how you can compare then data sheets from the linear model and from the general model, because this is still uh, possible. Uh, I uh, again want to mention you can come become a certified uh, 1288 user or expert. Uh, for more details, I have uh, given you the link. You will uh, again can download these slides um, if you want. And also you can obtain um, uh, standard documents and other general information about the 1288 standard from the link I uh, have shown at the bottom here of this slide. Thank you again for attending this webinar. And I look forward uh, to see you all again then uh, tomorrow at uh, 4 uh, p.m. again Central European time for the final webinar on how to uh, basically use the 1288 summary data sheet. Thank you very much again for listening and see you all tomorrow again. Bye bye.